The Lord be with you. If you'll join with me in turning in your copy of Holy Scripture or reading along there on the screen with 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Pick up where we left off last week, actually. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 10, reading through verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Kephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. May we do, Lord, what you call us to do, so that we may, that we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So here we are again with the Corinthians and all of their conflicts. But to be fair, Paul doesn't really write any letters in the New Testament uh, that say things like, To the church at such and such a place, from the Apostle Paul, you're fabulous. Keep up the good work. He doesn't do it. Each of Paul's epistles is written in response to some issue, some problem some conflict in the congregation of the faithful. But with this letter to the Corinthians, it seems as if Paul's whole purpose for the entire letter was to address divisions of all sorts within the body. The congregation at Corinth looked less like a a master's single work of art and more like a windshield that's been cracked and shattered by a rogue rock on the highway. And it isn't just one or two points of conflict at Corinth that have everybody messed up, no. There seem to be several simultaneous sources of division among the sisters and brothers at Corinth. New Testament scholar Ben Witherington III outlines them pretty well in his commentary on the two Corinthian epistles. We've actually read about one of the sources of the conflicts in in the verses before us this morning. Paul says, each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. It's a matter of brand names. Some of the folks at Corinth rallied around Paul. Now, I can understand that. These folks, maybe they were some of the original charter members of the church at Corinth. They were there from the beginning. They were the folks who helped old brother Paul when he showed up, took up an offering, maybe gave the first hundred dollars, taught the first Sunday school classes. Well, I bet if there was a building at Corinth, they probably had their name engraved on a plaque around the cornerstone. They were the kind of folks who, after Paul left, when they came to church, always stopped and lingered a bit longer in the foyer and gazed at at the picture of brother Paul hanging on the wall. They loved their old pastor, and they still missed him. So they said, you know what, we're with Paul. We're the folks who were here with Paul. And they branded themselves with his name. But then there were the new folks, those who had joined the congregation since Paul had left, since the new guy had arrived. Those who said, I belong to Apollos. Apollos. 
Now, now Paul, by tradition, uh, t- we're told that he was kind of ugly, bent over, short, bug-eyed, uh, had a big head. I mean, it's in the it's in these texts we have. Uh, wasn't wasn't a very he he kind of liked to get up and be technical when he talked. But Apollos, man, Apollos was George Clooney in a tie. Man, this guy showed up, and he started. He was slick. Uh, an educated man from Alexandria. And as with every new minister, every new minister that comes, there were changes. And I'm sure he heard about some of them. There were some folks who were on board and some folks who weren't. Well, I bet Apollos heard his fair share of people saying, now, Brother Apollos, I I like what you've been doing, but some people have said, or I bet he heard, now, now, Brother Apollos, we appreciate this, but when Brother Paul was here, we did it this way. Of course, those who claimed to belong to Apollos would have been those who, while the others were sort of lovingly gazing at the picture of Paul in the foyer, they would have hung an equally nice picture of Apollos, right next, maybe with a bigger frame. They'd have made sure Apollos' name got put on the pastor study and on the church sign. They were with Apollos. But then again, in those situations, there are those people who, who don't like to choose sides. They'd rather rise above the conflict. They don't choose sides, but instead they choose to move a step up. There are folks who would have said things like, well, now I know some of y'all like Brother Paul and some of y'all like Brother uh, Apollos, but me, I always find it's best to follow somebody who'd been there from the beginning. So I'm a follower of Brother Kephas. And in case you don't know who Kephas is, that's Peter. They said, I'm a follower of Peter. It's like somebody had said, now I know y'all like Pastor Billy Bob and y'all like Pastor Joe Jack, but me, I follow Billy Graham. Right? It's somebody trying to step above the conflict, but really just making another one. Those who claimed to belong to Peter were like those trying to one-up those caught in the squabbles of picking a favorite pastor. But there are always those others. When someone tries to go one up, that they try to go one more up. Those who like to one up the one uppers. Those who take a side in such a way that you can't argue with them. It's like a false highest ground. There were those at Corinth who said, I belong to Paul. I belong to Apollos. Well, I belong to Peter. Well, that's nice. I belong to Christ. That's what they did. How do you argue with that? It'd be like a bunch of folks arguing, who do you think the best preacher around is now? Oh, you know, I don't like to get into such things because I think Jesus was the best preacher there ever was. Like a kid in Sunday school, who parted the Red Sea? Jesus. I mean, it's the wrong answer, but you can't tell them it's the wrong answer because Jesus is never supposed to be the wrong answer. It's a sort of cop-out. And it's one at church you don't get called out on. So, of course, there were some who said, I am with Christ. That was one source of the conflict, growing rivalries around who their favorite preacher was, around their leaders. Then there were those conflicts, those divisions caused by the social constructs of the day, specifically those that favored the wealthy. Corinth was a diverse city, a city that at one time had been destroyed by the Romans, and then the Romans decided we need it back, and so they rebuilt it and used it as a location Uh, to relocate people they didn't really like, the dregs of the surplus population. It quickly, though, became a a center of busy trade for the Roman Empire, became a place where people could get rich. And naturally, in such a place, class divisions would arise, and such divisions carried over into the life of the church. Such class divisions, however, went beyond just the type of, of chariot they may have pulled up in what kind of car they drove to church on Sunday morning. Paul speaks in chapter 11 of this epistle of ways that the, this, these divisions were carried over into the observance of the Lord's Supper with the rich coming in early, taking the best seats, the nice couches, eating all the nice food, and then the poor, when they got off work, when they shook the dust out of their hair, came in, oh, they just had to find somewhere to sit, sit on the floor, stand in the corner. You want something to eat? There's a little bit left. These sorts of cultural and class divisions also led to lawsuits. Paul talks about that in chapter 6. That they were people, it was natural outside. I mean, it was like Judge Judy in Corinth. People on the outside were suing one another left and right. Paul says, stop doing that. You're Christians. Fix it among yourselves. 
Why, it even probably contributed to the conflicts surrounding sexual misconduct in chapter 5 and the presence of a man who was living and even sleeping with his stepmother. He was probably rich. And you can't, you can't, you can't pick on the people who pay your bills. And Paul says, what are you doing? Despite all of these divisions that were taking place in Corinth, it's interesting that not a single one of them is really about theology. None of them. In fact, the conflicts that might be considered theological are exposed as anything but when you examine them closely. For example, one may think that the divisions surrounding spiritual gifts hinted at by Paul in our text last week and addressed more fully in chapter 12 are certainly theological in nature. But the truth is, these arguments were not about theology. They were about who has the best spiritual gift. Whose gifting by the Holy Spirit was more important, more useful? Who was the more spiritual among them? It's not about theology. Members of the church were ranking their gifts, trying to find out how far ahead of everybody else they were in the congregation. That's not about theology. In chapter 8, one could say, well, Paul talks about food offered to idols. That's a theological issue, but the reality is that many of the folks at Corinth who had any measurable wealth had received it through business partnerships, business relationships in the community. And in order to keep these relationships, you often had to have meetings in the pagan temples and eat the food that they had there. So for Paul, that's not a theological issue. It's about whether one was willing to partake in these pagan practices in order to further one's own wealth. Not specifically about theology surrounding the pagan rituals in relation to a Christian understanding of idols. And even in chapter 15, where Paul has to address the existence of some, he says, say there is no resurrection of the dead. It is most likely a matter of personal security than it is theology. After all, if one operates under the notion that the hereafter doesn't exist or that we all simply float off into space when we die, what's the use of living this life for the sake of others. If there's no resurrection, then this world, this body, this community is just worthless dirt in the way of death. So Paul, Paul spends a few words unraveling the reality of the resurrection as he speaks of Christ's resurrection, but he gets to the practical point of it all in verse 30 of that chapter when he says, well, why am I putting myself in danger every hour? In other words... Paul places before those arguing about, against the resurrection that his very actions on behalf of Christ are partly motivated by his belief in such a resurrection. For Paul, it's about motivation, not theology. Of course, conflicts and division within any church are rarely, and I'd say if ever, about theology. While I have heard of more churches dividing over things like the color of the carpet, the location of the church sign, should we include a guitar in worship or not? Why doesn't the pastor wear a tie? I've even heard of churches arguing over all kinds of silly things. But you know, I have never in my life, and I know I ain't lived long, but I bet the oldest among us hadn't either. I have never in my life heard of a church splitting and getting into it over the orthodox Trinitarian views of the nature of God. Not once. I have heard of and experienced more conflict and division around things like the format of the bulletin. Can you believe, can you believe that we have cream-colored cardstock now? What was wrong with the pictures of the flowers and the Bible verses? I'm leaving. What was wrong? I've heard of churches splitting over the times of worship. You mean we're going to meet at 10? But the Bible says 11. What do you mean? I've heard even division over the number of times we have the Lord's Supper. A church has the Lord's Supper. Is it once a quarter enough? What are we turning into, a bunch of Catholics? I've heard it. I can even remember once, and this really happened to me, in the church where I served, we had decided for a season to place the offering at the end of the service, after the sermon, after the invitation, in order to highlight giving as an aspect of worship during a season of stewardship. After the first of such services, I was standing at the back of the church. I remember it like it was yesterday. A church member made a beeline to me and started to chew me out. How dare you but the offering at the end of the service? That ain't where it's supposed to go. It should be in the middle. I'm not coming back until you fix it. Silly. Silly. 
Church conflict and division is rarely, if ever, about theology. It wasn't about theology at Corinth. If it was, Paul would have written more in the language of his epistle to the Romans. He would have taken the opportunity in the verses before us to lay out his understanding of baptism, as he does in Romans 6. But instead, he chooses to highlight the ridiculousness of bragging about who baptized whom. He could have taken time in chapter 11 to lay out a clear understanding of the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, in order to highlight its importance and its centrality in Christian worship and what it means, what it really means. Then maybe we wouldn't argue about it so much, but instead, instead Paul reprimands those who take advantage of their status in life and abuse the privilege of being first at the Lord's table. He could have outlined a history of the Judeo-Christian doctrine of resurrection in chapter 15, calling those who had rejected such a doctrine as fools and even calling them out on the carpet as unfit to be Christians. But instead, he calls attention to his work and the work of those who have placed their lives on the line for the cause of God's kingdom because of their trust in the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the dead. Paul doesn't, as he does in Romans, present an outline, systematic theology, complete with scriptural citation, charts, and annotated footnotes, because Paul knows what all of us in ministry have come to know, what those who've been around congregations long enough know all too well, that conflict and division is rarely, if ever, about theology. So then what's it about? Division, whether in a congregation, a family, a club, a country, always finds its root in that familiar foe. Conflict can always trace its origins back to the same fractured foundation that has set the world off balance. Division and conflict are grounded in the same original sin that haunts every dark crevice of human experience. That one sin that we find at the source of them all. Selfishness. For as long as there is a thought or concern of self above others, division and conflict cannot help but spring up. So long as I care more about myself than I care about you, there will always be an atmosphere for division. As long as I think that I'm better than you, holier than you, more righteous than you, cleaner than you, more deserving than you, There will always be ground for conflict. As long as I think that I am in any way above anyone, there is a crack wide enough to separate me from everyone, even God. Because you see, conflict, especially church conflict, isn't about theology. No, it's about me. About me and my sinful belief that I am better than anyone. I think that's why Paul, and more than anywhere else in all the letters written by him or in his name, speaks about the cross to these conflicted Corinthians. He writes, for Christ did not send me to baptize. He almost says, you can all work that out yourself. I don't care. He didn't send me to baptize. You can figure out if it's sprinkling, dunking, if it's on Sunday, if it's more than once. I don't care. You figure out. God didn't send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel. And not with eloquent wisdom, maybe that's a little dig at at Apollos, I don't know. But he says, so that the cross of Christ may not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. The cross? The cross. That's the power of God. You want to talk about power? What about when he held the elders in the palm of his hand, teaching them in the temple when he was just 12? That sounds like power. You want power? What about when thousands of people were hungry and he fed every last one of them with more left over from just a few fish and a handful of bread? You want to talk about power? What about that day? You really want to talk about it. What about that day standing in Bethany by that tomb and calling out the three-day dead Lazarus to come out and he walks right out of the tomb? You want to talk about power. Raising a man from the dead, that's power. 
The power of God. If there's power to be witnessed, surely it's in the shell of a tomb left empty by the raised Son of God on that first Easter Sunday morning. But the cross? The cross. That's the power of God? Death? Pain? Suffering? Loss? That's the power of God? Yeah. Yes. Because there on that cross, the God of creation proved once and for all that the way of God is not one of selfishness. That the way of God is one of self-emptying love. Because there on that cross, God showed the universe that strength, might, fierceness, supremacy, and whatever we may think power is, it is not the way. There in the cross, in Christ on the cross, we see the power of God as we see the strength it takes to lay down the life of the one who spoke the very cosmos into being. In the cross, we see the power of God as we see the unfailing, eternal, selfless love of the God who even in his anguish, even when he could have called it all off and given it all up, cried out, Father, forgive them. And it's there, there in that cross, that we see the power of God to overcome whatever lines we have drawn, to knock down whatever walls we've built or planned to build, to mend whatever hairs we've split, to heal the wounds of discontent, to bring together those from every walk of life and every corner of creation. There in the cross is the power of God to overcome division and cure conflict. There in the cross is the power of God to overcome all the sources of our failures, our heartaches, our disappointments, our hatred, our bigotry, our indifference, and our selfishness. There in the cross, Paul says, is the power of God. The power of God to overcome. All those things. And it's the power of God to even overcome me. Let us pray. Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Eternal One who gave his life on the cross for us. Lord, when we think too much of ourselves, when we think that the lines we draw are important, the lists and ranks that we create are of you, remind us, God, of the cross. Whenever, Lord, we think that we have things in the palm of our hand and figured out, Remind us, Lord, that nothing in this world we do can come close to the power of that cross. Lord, whenever, whenever there is light through the cracks of division, God, we pray we turn to the cross to seal them and unite around the one thing we all have in common, the one thing we all need, and that's the power of God. So Holy Spirit, move among us in this place, this place filled with diverse people of all different places and thoughts that come here, Lord, to see the cross, to be reminded of its power. Remind us now, Holy Spirit, and call us together in the power of that cross. We pray in the name of the Christ who died upon it. Amen.